Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. With self-care strategies from Chinese medicine, functional medicine, Ayurveda, neuroscience, and beyond. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist and transformation catalyst, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity. I'm your host, Brody Welch, a licensed acupuncturist, herbalist, and holistic health strategist. And I'm proud to say I'm actually giving myself a little bit of a break from recording new episodes right now. Last episode was number 200, marking a new show nearly every week for four years. And I'm just going to press pause for a beat to recalibrate what I want to do with the show and to just restore some of my creativity. Now, in the past few years, in addition to conducting boatloads of interviews, I've also given a fair number as well. And I thought that might be a good use of this blank spot in the podcast production schedule this week to share one of the interviews that I gave on the podcast of a friend of mine, my friend Ali Shapiro and her show Insatiable, which is all about exploring our relationship with food. She was kind enough to give me permission to rebroadcast this episode that I did for season seven of her show on eating triggers. And I did this interview back when I was first crafting my message about self-care really being about embodying self-respect through our daily habits. And one of the reasons that I have such a good time talking with Allie is that she loves to geek out about health, but she's also a systems thinker like me who loves blending paradigms and isn't afraid to point out that a lot of the struggles that we face in taking care of ourselves as individuals exist within this greater societal context. Things like capitalism and sexism and racism are necessarily part of these conversations that we have about health and self-care and happiness. If you have found yourself stress eating or comfort eating or being triggered to eat when you're not necessarily hungry, I think you'll find something helpful and useful in this episode rebroadcast from Ali Shapiro's Insatiable podcast with her permission on eating triggers. And while I am taking this short break from producing a podcast episode every week, I have not taken a break from coaching. If you are interested in working with me and breaking some of the patterns that might have seeped in during this crazy pandemic time, I would love to help you reset a new normal for yourself. So feel free to head over to brodywelch.com or shoot me an email at brody at brodywelch.com. That's brody with an IE and Welch with a CH. And without further ado, enjoy. When you're fed up with fighting food and your body, join us here. I'm Ali Shapiro, creator of the Truce With Food program and your host for Insatiable, where we explore the hidden aspects of fighting our food, our weight, and our bodies, and dive deep into nutrition science and true whole health. Fair warning, this is not your parents' health care. This is a big rebel yell to those who crave meaning, hunger for truth, and whose lust for life is truly insatiable. Believe me, freedom awaits. Welcome, everybody, to season five of Insatiable. This season, our theme is eating triggers, namely triggers for the on-off eating cycle. And we really want you to get clarity about these triggers because clarity is a process and a tool. And what do I mean by this? Well, when we are clear, we are able to get to the root cause rather than wasting our time and energy working on things that aren't really the issue. For example, falling off the on and off cycle is not about willpower or discipline, which we're going to especially learn about today. Second, logic doesn't change us. We need to have things resonate, see things from a different angle, and clarity helps us do that. 
It connects to our emotional logic. And lastly, clarity equals distance. So if you've ever been able to get over something from the past, you know that's because you have distance from it. You're able to see what you were doing, what other people were doing, the context of the situation. And when we have clarity in the present moment, we get a little bit of distance so we can choose differently moment by moment. So that's why we're focusing so much on clarity. So what triggers us specifically to stop our self-care? What's the difference between willpower and habits? In today's episode, Eating Triggers Embody Self-Respect, Brody Welsh, acupuncturist, Chinese medicine expert, and self-care strategist will teach us how to not let stress trigger us to eat. A little bit more about Brody. Brody Welsh is a licensed acupuncturist, board certified herbalist, which is no easy feat, by the way, (laughs) Chinese medicine expert, holistic transformation coach, and self-care strategist. She's the founder of Life and Balance Acupuncture in Coravala, Oregon. I hope I pronounced that right, where she's been treating patients since 2003. Brody helps caring, high-achieving women put themselves on their own to-do lists so they can trade stress and burnout for energy, joy, and vibrant health. She's also the creator and host of A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world. Thank you so much for being here, Brody. Oh, I am so excited to have this conversation with you, Allie. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. So I think I want to first open up with defining embody and self-respect because I think you define those differently than probably most people. So I'd love to kick that off. Yeah, both of those words have a really deep meaning for me as I think about the kind of like what it is I do and who I help. Like that essentially that... I work with women who want more out of life. And a lot of these women, they're high achievers, they're professionals, they drive and strive, they achieve, they're so super competent, but they don't necessarily embody the same kind of like rocking performance that they do in the outer world. They don't feel like that inside. And so it's like they're likely to override their own needs in service of getting the job done or somebody else needs me, therefore I'm just going to put off even little things like drinking water or getting up and stretching and moving before answering an email or getting to bed on time or you know, just like the little things, which are really, it's these little things, which is how we embody self-respect in the sense that like we wouldn't take it from anybody else if they were like, no, you need to sit there and finish this before you can get up and, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. Or, or like, no, you should blow off your meditation practice so that you can get to work. You know, the, the driver in our heads is often totally disrespectful of our humanity. And so recognizing that even though a lot of my clients are such rock star achievers, and yet they do have this inner harshness, which is not particularly compatible passionate, not particularly respectful even. And so it's the kind of thing where like embodying self-respect to me means that you treat yourself as though you were the goddess, as though you were absolutely worthy of care without doing a thing. What struck me as you were explaining that, because I was thinking of Juliet and I, who are both pretty (laughs) hard drivers, probably like your clients, is that feeling of like the insides matching the outsides. I think Juliet and I both probably work with people as well who it's like you get all these accomplishments and you get all this done, yet it's never enough because on the inside, it doesn't feel satisfying. Like that word embody. I love that. Like the inside doesn't match the outside. Yeah. Yeah, And and I think for a lot of people, the achievements, it's not the answer, right? And it's this stuff. It's feeling good on the inside and you're having your health align that will actually give them that feeling of satisfaction. But it's funny because you don't even think about that. You just think about achieve more, achieve more. Well, and, and it's it's no one's fault that that is the orientation because we live in the society that's so obsessed with the doing at the expense of the being. It's a very masculine thing. I think it's part of living in a culture that is obsessed with yang as opposed to yin. If we we're going to use Chinese medicine terms, yang is the active, the external, the speed, the productive, the hot, the transforming. And yin is the quiet. It's the still. It's the inner. It's the intuitive. 
it's the yielding, it's the inward. And and so we're in the society that basically if you're going inward, if you're slowing down, if you're taking a rest, you're lazy. You're not doing enough, you know? And so <laughs> there's this deep contrast between it's very hard to honor your yin. And when you do that, this is the paradox that I, I love Chinese medicine for its paradox. The fact that we need really good yin in order to have good yang, that you can't possibly, we know this, right? Like when you haven't gotten a good night's sleep, you can't possibly be at the top of your game. You can't be creating and producing and on in the same way that if you had slept solidly through the night and you woke up and you had just exactly the kind of morning that's going to set you up for being in the zone. It's like, you can't do that if you haven't been taking care of yourself. And it's these simple things that we do every day that allow us to, that this is how we embody self-respect is with these core competencies of self-care. And when we have those on board, we really are able to show up to do our best work in the world, but it's really, really easy because nobody sees that stuff going on. We don't see that that's actually the key to being able to achieve beyond what we imagine we're capable of. It's so funny you say that because, so I took a nap yesterday and I took a nap today. (laughs) And (laughs) and part of it is that I have my period. So I'm just like a little extra exhausted. And so my body's just really needing the rest. But a friend of mine, he knew that I had taken a nap yesterday and he called me today and it was so funny. He was like, are you taking another nap? And I was like, I mean, I was thinking about it. He's like, are you laying right now? It was just hilarious. I'm like, yes, I am laying right now. <laughs> like, as though that's like the most decadent and shocking thing possible. Yeah, that yeah. that you, you dare allow your expectations for yourself to fluctuate with your monthly cycle? Like, what are you? Some kind of, I mean, just really like, <laughs> you're you, a have the, you have the audacity to respect yourself. And I was like, yes, I am laying right now. But then inside it was like, Oh, but I'm doing emails while I'm laying. Oh, I'm I'm gonna get things done. But like the reality of it is, is that like I need to rest. I'm not productive right now. Like I need to let my body reset and be able to go inward so that I can produce more outward. <laughs> so I'm curious though, Brody, how you approach this because I think people hearing this will be like, yeah, I get this in theory, mm-hmm. but then, you know, okay, so like we have one foot on the gas, right? Like I get this. I want to feel good. I want yeah. to feel fulfilled. But then the break is always, but what if I miss out? What if I fall behind? And really what I think I'm hearing and maybe I'm projecting my own like internal, what I think is you have to have trust in the long tail of life, not kind of like, like what Juliet said, well, I'm being productive. I'm getting emails done. But like, how do you develop that respect or trust to trust that the long tail <laughs> of, okay, you may be taking a nap today, but that's going to help you reach beyond what you imagine possible, as you said, you know, just a couple of minutes ago. I'm hearing several questions in there, uh, which which I'd love to address. So it's it sounds like you're saying there there's some resistance to. Okay, I get what you're saying in theory, but if I actually do this, if I actually dare to honor my yin, if I actually dare to listen to my body and have a non productive day at the risk of the productivity police coming over and arresting you, right? Like that that I might what lose my edge. I might, it might not work. And inherent in that question is the idea of having to show up differently in the world. For a lot of us, we have used for a very long time and to great success, either a survival strategy for navigating the world that's gotten us where we are today. So whether that's over-delivering or over-serving or being a perfectionist or a people pleaser or like whatever it is, we might need to stop doing that and let go of that way of being in the world in order to actually embrace our potential. And that's very scary because it means letting go of the tried and true. And the momentum of our past has a lot of influence about, you know, like if this is our safe zone is just suck it up and do it, then we never get to explore and play with those colors of what it could be like to actually have a little more time for ourselves, actually have a little bit more time to do our creative passions or to go inward or to have some 
that fallow season that will allow for the crops to yield even greater supply next season. And it's very scary. And there's not a lot of support for that because when we try to let go of the way that we used to do something, there's all kinds of things that can drag us back. You know, so it's super hard. So that's like what the first part of what I heard you say. The other is like basically is that like people don't necessarily trust that like walking out on that limb feels perilous and that i think is because we have this sense that i think again a cultural thing where we're so steeped in the idea that we have to be constantly doing that we we don't actually acknowledge that everything in the universe operates according to this pulsation right that in yoga it's called spanda right the expansion and contraction like the lub dub of the heartbeat the inhale and the exhale of the breath the, the taking in and letting go of the digestive system like absolutely everything in the body operates in this yin and yang pulsation and we like to think that we're machines we like to think that you know like from 8 to 5 we have to be in this hyper masculine productive mode and we you'd like that And the idea of there being work smarter, not harder, the idea of really syncing up with natural cycles and our own, you know, internal biological cycles, it goes against the grain of the brainwashing that's inherent in the culture that we live in. So it means like, it's pretty radical. It's a pretty radical act of feminism, I think, to take care of yourself just because we're in a culture that, you know, where it's not about how it feels. It's about how it looks and it's about doing more and like even at the expense of your health and happiness. Yeah. So then I guess my question, and I totally agree with all of that. And I love that you said this is like a feminist issue because when you're talking about over-delivering or over-performing and a lot of the stuff that drains us, especially as women is emotional labor, right? Like making sure everyone else is okay and, and happy with our choices or we're not disappointing people and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But when you say potential then, I think a lot of people might think, well, my over-delivering is helping me reach my career potential. And are you saying there's a sweet spot and that our potential may look differently or not? I'm just curious. Uh, Well, I think that people have been able to achieve what they've been able to achieve running the race, carrying you know a 50-pound backpack. And that when we honor our yin, when we do things like start the day with meditation or get enough sleep or nourish ourselves the way our bodies want to be fed, that it's like the backpack comes off and we're still able to do far more than we could before with more ease and with more satisfaction and personal fulfillment than we ever thought possible. And the other part of our potential really is that being in that hyper-productive, hyper-responsible mode is it does things to our energy in the body, right? The driving and striving energy in Chinese medicine correlates with the liver. And basically we can, it, the liver's responsibility is not just as the organ of filtration that helps detoxify us and helps us digest, you know, that produces bile so we can digest our fat. In Chinese medicine, the liver is also about the free and easy flow of energy in the body and is responsible for the free movement of all emotions in the body and having an even relate, like it's responsible for timing of the menstrual cycle, of the digestive system, of being able to have easy going to sleep and waking up, that anything that happens in a rhythm is affected by the liver. And so if we've been driving our nervous systems with you know, caffeine and sugar and alcohol to like rev up or slow down or to kind of keep our hands on the reins in service of our minds, when we're, when we're identifying with our minds at the expense of our bodies, that the liver chi stagnates. And when the liver chi stagnates, we get tense, we get tight, we feel it in the gallbladder channel, which is like up in the neck and shoulders area. So the tight neck and shoulders, the shallow breathing, we start to see hormone imbalance, we start to see migraine headaches, we start to see tension in the body because the liver also correlates with the tendons and sinews. It's like our whole experience of our bodies could be different if we let go of that stagnant liver chi suddenly all that goes away. Our experience of ease opens up. We have access to flow states in a way that we never could. When we're in fight or flight or when we're in stress mode, we're fundamentally not capable of being in our prefrontal cortex, our full humanity, our full creativity, our full compassion, all of that. So our whole experience of the world is different. Oh my God, that's so inspiring. Like seriously, like, because when you were describing too about the pulsing, like yin and yang are going to pulse or whatnot, right? And expansion and contraction. So it's like, you can either work with that or make it feel like it's sabotaging you. 
Exactly. And there's nothing in life that's immune from that. The cycles of day and night, the cycles of the season is all about this, this everything, everything from the day to a plant, to an animal, to us, to every cell in our bodies, microcosm and macrocosm, meaning if it's out there, it's in here. It goes according to the cycle of birth, growth, maturity, decline, and death. And so it's just like, where are we in that cycle? Recognizing where we are in the course of a day, in the course of our lifetime with respect to any particular project and being able to work with it and not against it is the original biohacking, thousands of years old, thanks to Chinese medicine. (laughs) I guess one of the things that I'm thinking about is how do we unprogram ourselves and allow ourselves to give in to this yin more, you know, the practicality of it all. And I'm sure that you work on this with your clients a lot, just giving them some concrete things to put into practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, myself as an example is I definitely have that constant need and drive to feel productive, yet doesn't mean that I'm being productive. It's just the anxiety and the guilt that comes along with with it. If I am allowing myself to, like I said, lay down, you know, or I'm not doing anything during hours that I feel like I should be. And that guilt and that anxiety weighs heavy on people, even if they're not actually doing the things that they intend to do. Yeah, definitely. So when when you were aware of that the other day, when you had that voice in your head that was telling you that you needed to be checking your email while you were resting or feeling like you needed to defend yourself against your friend who was (laughs) going to do the productivity police, like what was it that you became aware of I'm curious about your inner dialogue in that moment, that just that that part of you that knew that it was kind of a false belief that you actually needed to be, quote unquote, being productive. Like why? Or just to, sort of a, what I'm curious about is what was the limiting belief that was driving you in that moment? And what was the deeper truth that you were eventually able to realize? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm, like, I'm pretty good at taking care of myself and trying to understand my monkey brain versus mm-hmm. you know, my intuitive you know, nature and what it really needs. So in that moment, I could really kind of differentiate between the two. It would be nice though to not even have that like lingering guilt or anxiety. I think for me, because I'm a business owner, it's this constant defense of like I need to be on and I need to be making sure that, you know, things don't fall apart, even though the reality of it is, you know, I have lots of pieces in place and lots of things that won't allow that to happen. But it's also, mm-hmm. I think, defending yourself against just wanting to look good, like make yourself look good, not even for other people. But I think a lot of us just like want to impress ourselves and feel like we're, we look good for, you know, in our own mind. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is that you had some mindfulness and awareness that, oh yeah, there's this part of me that feels like I need to be on all the time, but I actually know that my business isn't going to totally fall apart if I lie on the couch for a half an hour. Like that there's an awareness, there's this pressure that you felt the need to be on and some self-awareness recognizing that it's actually not the end of the world if you give yourself a bit of a break. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. Okay. And so mindfulness is one of those tools, is recognizing when you are caught up in a stress state and recognizing that what you're believing is a choice, right? That we can choose to believe that our self-worth is solely predicated on our productivity. But probably that's not your true value, Juliet, right? Like that's the value of the society that you're living in. And yes, you value productivity and you're a business owner. And of course you care about that, but there's probably also lots of other things that you value. Like for example, your own health and your own ability that basically that being at war with yourself creates another layer of tension, which doesn't need to be there and goes away when you relax into the fact that there's going to be a time for productivity, but there's also going to be a time for rest and feeling capable and competent enough to be as committed to wherever you are in that cycle and letting it be okay to be a human being. So yeah, there's and a, I think yeah. that also, Ali, I don't know if you feel this way, just like being an entrepreneur, because we create our own structure. Sometimes, you know, we start to like live by rules to make ourselves feel almost like we're a little bit more a part of regular society, you know, like I need to be working. I need to feel this productivity level when really the reason why we're entrepreneurs is to have the freedom to not be that. And I think it can be sort of challenging because, again, the messages that we receive from those around us and the world we live in about, you know, needing to be on during these specific hours or times. 
Yeah. Well, and I also, you know, as Brody was talking, I was thinking this just happened to me today. You know, I'm in a co-working space and this one friend of mine who we met at the, we went to the Families Belong Together rally, or we, we didn't go together. We ran into each other in Pittsburgh several months ago when all the, well, kids are still in cages and separated at the time of this recording, but we met down there. So we have like this social justice, you know, bond or, or whatnot. And she stopped by my office today and she's like, how are you doing? And I was like, oh, I was like, I just got off the phone calling my senator and representative about there's this bill in the Senate right now for the 5G networks, long story, whatever. And she's like, well, it's great that you called. And I was like, it feels like it's never enough. you know. And that's what I was like saying to her. I was like, I just feel like there's all these problems. And I know I have this protector role. Like I feel protective of my clients. I feel protective of people in my life. And I feel like I have a lot of capacity to protect people. And so now that like everyone in my life is okay. My business is okay. Like my clients are doing okay. And I know how to hold them there. It's like, I've gone to social justice, right? To be like, oh my God, there's more protection to do. And she's like, well, isn't that so how we're conditioned as women though? Like to do all the emotional labor and to keep feeling like we aren't doing enough. And as Brody was talking, I was like, we need to unhook to say like, it's inhumanly possible to care about every issue. And I think this comes back to trust though, is like trusting that other people are doing their part. Yet when you look at the reality, and this is where I have trouble with, especially as I look at all like, you know, everyone's talking about white women need to understand about intersectional feminism. I don't see a lot of white men doing any sort of activism, right? <laughs> and we see Louis C.K. just came back on the circuit, not having like done any sort of soul searching work or whatever. And I have watched Louis C.K. and I used to be a big fan of his. Like, so I've been paying attention to this. But how do you navigate the fact that like some people just aren't pulling their weight? I mean, I, this is kind of like a total tangent, but I think this is what deep down, it's like, I need to unhook from that. But like, you still want to be a participant and contribute to, to things. I don't well, know. I, I mean, like, what, I, think. what I hear is like a, like a very black and white kind of thought thinking, I think we get trapped in, which is like, either I'm really productive and I'm part of everything and I'm doing and I'm contributing, or I'm just like being really lazy and not participating yeah. and it's like staying on the sidelines of my life. <laughs> but I think that derails us from self-respect. Well, it really can. I think it, it comes back to a question of motivation and that what is your motivation? Like, for example, I grew up feeling like I didn't have the right to exist on the planet by virtue of the fact that I was born into a white middle class household in suburban Massachusetts. You know, like I just felt like if I literally wasn't spending my days volunteering and social justice work and activism, if my external did not match my internal every single day, then I was, I should basically kill myself. I mean, like, that's really where I was like, because otherwise you're just complicit and evil. So what good yeah. are you? You know, <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, and, and the thing that like got me unhooked from that is spirituality is recognizing that if we just judge ourselves by our actions, we're essentially falling into the materialist trap and not mm. actually seeing ourselves as, for example, you know, you could go again, if we're polarizing the black and white examples, that somebody who's burning out, burning the candle at both ends, giving 110% at their job, at their home and on the social justice front, is that person doing more or less good in the world than the person who is meditating eight hours a day, like the Dalai Lama or, you know, and who's just <laughs> radiating love at everyone that they pass and smiling at strangers and holding the door for people and being just an all around, like just awesome force of love in the world and giving where they can and, you know, writing the occasional letter or making the occasional phone call. But I feel like there's a big spectrum there and that we all have our own dharma and that really Really, that if we're making our self worth predicated on our actions, we're going to lose because we're all inherently worthy, or at least I believe that we exist. Like we didn't ask to be here, but we are. So it's a gift. And what we choose to, to do with our lives, that there's a, again, to go Chinese medicine on this, if we all have a purpose that is said to live in our kidneys, that's part of our, like where our mission in life would be housed. It's, it also is connected to your innate gifts and talents that that's your innate nature is your Jing. Jing is this special substance that like, it's also the sand in your hourglass. And when you run out of it, like your time is up. 
and we can slow down our rate of consumption of our jing by living in balance, right? By making sure that we're not overextending ourselves, that we are nourished by our life experience, by the food that we're eating, by getting enough sleep, et cetera. Just kind of like that when we are living off the interest in our bank account and not dipping into the principal or the jing, that is basically how we can stay healthy. And also, and there's enough stillness that the consciousness can reflect on your essence such that you know what's yours to do in the world. Because the only real way to navigate chaos in the world, which we clearly are, <laughs> is facing us every day, <laughs> is by being present enough to recognize the right action in the right moment. Yeah. Well, what I love that you said there, I think that was, I mean, I loved all of it, but I think especially when we're getting caught up in these old cycles and habits and patterns of, okay, I'm still over delivering. I'm still overworking is like, what's the real incentive? Like what would be really meaningful of why to change this? And when you're just talking about the kidney and the the jing, I'm like, oh my God, I want to conserve my jing. I'm not watching the news for like a week or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Good call, right? Spend (laughs) spend your life force being really judicious about what's getting your energy because where you put your attention is where you put your soul. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people start to feel like they're being indulgent, you know, and taking care of themselves in that way. And it's hard to differentiate like, am I being indulgent or, you know, is this like (laughs) self-preservation? Well, Julia, I'm really glad you use that word indulgent because that is people's, like especially women, that is the biggest fear, right? That self-care is somehow selfish. And this is where I really want to flip people's thinking because we somehow believe that it's totally fine to take care of our health once we have the heart attack or once we get the cancer diagnosis Mm -hmm. or the autoimmune diagnosis or once it's an emergency, then we're allowed to pay attention. But everything that we know, that every functional medicine person, that every Chinese medicine person or Ayurvedic practitioner, like whatever expert you want to talk to is going to tell you that we all need the same things, right? We all need to be honoring our sleep. We all need to be eating whole foods. We all need to be digesting well. We all need space and time to digest our life. We need connection to other people. We need to be hydrating and pooping. These are the things that we need in order to be healthy. And I don't care whether you're a brain doctor or a heart doctor or a gut doctor or a mental health practitioner you're going to prescribe the exact same things for your patients. And so doing those things every day for like a half an hour, you know, or like having boundaries around these things that everyone agrees are the pinnacles of self-care. It's not indulgent. That's socially responsible because if everyone were to act as if, you know, if everyone were to do that, we would save billions of dollars as a society in healthcare. And this isn't about pedicures. This isn't about the empty calories of self-care, which someone might and say could perhaps judge as indulgent. This is the absolute basics. Mm, I so, love- I w- so I would say it, it is responsible. You owe it to yourself and to everyone else around you to do these things because when you do, it's not selfish. It actually benefits everyone in your life. I love that. We're going to take a short break, Brody, but when we come back, I want to know how we start making this happen with the difference between willpower and habits. Sounds good. This insatiable episode is sponsored by my client described life-changing program, Why Am I Eating This Now? If you are tired of the on-off cycle, want food to stop being worth it in the moment, but not afterwards, and you want to stop self-sabotaging with food, This live program is for you. Early bird registration begins on September 10th. So visit alishapiro.com forward slash food freedom 2018 to sign up to be notified when registration opens for this year's live session. Want to know a little bit more? Stay tuned to the end of this episode. Okay, so we are back. I love all of this. Thank you. I feel like I'm having so many like mindset pivots. <laughs> so thank you. And I'm like, I need spirituality back in my life. I need to, I need to know my Dharma. <laughs> <laughs> but as we start to like, okay, test this out, like that it's not this win lose. And even as you were describing, like we wait till we have the heart attack or whatnot. It's like that black and white thinking that Juliet had outlined before. It's like <gasps> we're such an extreme society. How do we start to do this? Because I feel like people think, okay, then people tend to approach self-respect, what you're calling self-respect, like in this very dramatic way sometimes. Like, okay, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to meditate every morning. I'm going to dry brush. I'm going to get sunlight, drink my smoothie, you know, and they think they need all of this willpower. But you say there's a difference between willpower and habits. And I'd love to hear that. 
Yeah. Well, we are not creatures of willpower. We are creatures of habit. 40% of our day, an estimated 40% of our day is spent on autopilot, meaning on the things that happen pretty much without any conscious thought on our part. And if we can just automate the right habits and get all those things that are those core competencies of self-care, if we can get those onto autopilot, we don't have to spend time thinking, let's see, should I meditate today? Where am I going to meditate today? What am I going to need for that? You know, where's my cushion or where's my, you know, like just all this thinking, if it's just on autopilot, you don't question it. It just happens. And so this is when I start working with clients, I am big into habit change and teaching people how we automate how we bring these things into autopilot. So until they're on autopilot, they require willpower because it requires intentionality. And But once they are on autopilot, none of us really have to think about brushing our teeth or taking a shower. It just happens because we are creatures of routine. So generally speaking, with respect to willpower, So while you're bringing a habit into automation, it requires repetition and all habits exist, like all habits are inspired by a trigger. Then there's the behavior itself and then there's a reward that happens as a result of doing the habit or else it would evaporate. So there's always a payoff to us doing what we do. And sometimes that payoff is immediate and we don't need to create a reward for ourselves, but sometimes the reward is down the road, like with meditation. It's like you might feel a little bit more focused or a little bit more peaceful, but we know that after eight weeks of meditating 20 minutes a day, your actual brain changes. And at that point that you might really be feeling like you're operating differently in the world. So generally speaking, when we think about all the things that happen to us over the course of the day that are stressful, every single time we have to make a decision, anytime we're under stress, our willpower is reduced a little by little so that by the end of the day, we have very little left. So when we're trying to create a new habit, it's a really good idea to start in the morning. And this is kind of the fake it till you make it, like to circle back to something Juliet asked earlier is how do you actually do these things? that what are some of the secrets to bringing it online? One is to act as if, right? And so if we just kind of practice embodying self-respect, eventually we will be that person who embodies self-respect. So in other words, bringing in the behaviors first and then our identity shifts as a result of that. The other is mindset. It's just if you wake up in the morning and you feel like, oh yeah, I know that I am worth taking care of regardless about how much I get done in a day. I know that when I start my day from a place of centered calm, I am going to be much more intentional about how I live today. And then basically start habit stacking. So for example, if you know that what's missing from your life is exercise and like that enables you to be clear, it, when you exercise, you're more likely to make healthy eating choices, you're more likely to get better sleep. That's going to be what we call a keystone habit or a habit that provides structural and foundational support for other healthy behaviors. And for a lot of people, is exercise. For a lot of people, it's getting enough sleep. Like for me, I'm much less likely to crave sugar and caffeine if I'm well rested. I'm also much more likely to have an even mood. I'm much more likely to handle stress well. So for me, getting enough sleep means going to bed on time. So what does it take for me to go to bed on time? Well, what does it mean that I need to be doing at 9 p.m. if I'm going to try to be asleep by 10? Because again, we're not machines. We don't shut off in an instant. And so recognizing, getting curious about what our keystone habits might be and starting there, because a lot of times if we can really dial in our keystone habit, a lot of these other behaviors just are going to fall into place by themselves. And that's really the trick is getting a habit to flourish is finding the right place for it to live in the course of our day so that we just know it's got a time, it's got a place, we know it's going to happen and it can be non-negotiable. I like, especially when starting new habits, this is like dynamite. I love knowing that like meditation takes eight weeks because I've meditated on and off in my life, but that would motivate me to try it. Like, I'm like, okay, I need eight weeks and then my brain will change and it's not going to take as much effort. You know, because that's like hugely, like, I think I'm going to try that. Versus I'm like, I would like eight days, please. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it's like, that's the, that's what we're promised, right? Is that, you know, like the eight minute abs or the like three day detox or that, you know, just this idea of do it fast and get it over with. And sometimes, you know, like there is, 
more isn't necessarily better. We know with exercise, a lot of the gains are the first 20 minutes. And, and with meditation, you don't necessarily need hours and hours, but we do know that there's good data on the 20 minutes. And we also know that even you know something like a gratitude journal of just five minutes of gratitude journaling can have an effect on happiness even six months later. So there's certain things where there can be a little bit of effort that can result in big bang for your buck, so to speak. And a lot of these things that once they're there, once they're on autopilot, it's easy to scale up, especially on things like meditation where it's challenging. I've, I've had a meditation practice for 20 years and I still am tempted to go quote unquote, do stuff, be productive. And it can be like, I feel like I'm a caged animal trying to champ at the bit, you know, instead of sitting on my cushion. So I will set a timer and I know that that timer will go off, but I know that every time I choose to refocus on my breath, I choose to refocus on what my energy is doing in my body. I choose to watch my thoughts. What I'm doing is I'm regaining, I'm taking the reins so that I can pull my mind back to what I value instead of getting caught up in the sea of other people's values and agendas. And so that makes me more self-respecting because it makes me more autonomous and inwardly directed as opposed to falling prey to being in a reactive state. I'm driving the bus. I am being proactive about what I want my life to look like that day. Yeah. And I was thinking for people that when it comes to creating a new habit, a lot of what holds people back is wanting to do it the right way wanting to master it, you know, or wanting to do well at it, you know, oh, I'm not good at meditation. So it's like, I'm not going to keep going with this because I suck at it, you know, that kind of thing. Or I don't feel confident in the gym or in shape enough to go to that class yet. So it's like putting things off because they know that they're not going to be doing it well. boy, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, avoiding and perfectionism. It's like it's it's an ego strategy. And it's just like going to the gym for the first time, you wouldn't expect yourself to lift the heaviest barbell the first day out. And it's the same thing with meditation is I'm constantly saying, give yourself permission to be the world's worst meditator, but don't let that stop you from doing it. Yeah. One thing I think is really important that I want listeners to really realize, because I think the term mind and mindset get thrown out like very like, oh, it's about your thoughts. And mindset is one thing that happens indefinite. Like you have a mindset and it never changes. And to your point, Brody, about being a 20-year meditator, it's like your mindset may feel different every day. But what I really want people to realize is that your mind is not just your thoughts. Like no one has been able to locate the mind. It's an invisible projection between your body and your thoughts. And so knowing that, we know that what we're sensing and what we're feeling and what we're intuiting is just just as important as what we're thinking. It's not like I always tell my clients, we're not going to like make you stop thinking because that's a really great part of you, but we want to bring up these other inputs. And I think embodying self-respect helps, gives us access to these other, like the senses of our, you know, of what it feels like on our body, what it, you know, what it smells, what it tastes, what we're really feeling. And then our intuition, we can get clear versus as you were talking, Brody, about how we can just get swamped up in everybody else's stimuli and making these habits and working on this. I can totally, I'm starting to see like the exponential effect of like really getting more done with less like flailing and, and yeah self-sabotage. Well, the other thing about thoughts is that we think that they're ours, but they're not. (laughs) You know, that what we believe and what we think about is affected by, we're ecosystems. So we are affected by the conversations that we have every day with the news and media that we tune into or don't tune into, that even how our gut serotonin can influence our view of the world, like that what we, our, our microbiomes can affect our mental health and our outlook. What literally, and in Chinese medicine, again, digesting the world and our life experience and digesting our food is a function of the spleen and stomach. And that also is the organ system responsible for our intention. So when we think about our mental focus, about what we're choosing to focus on, what we're thinking about and what we're believing, that is influenced by the people that we hang out with. That is influenced by the conversations that we tune into. So the fact that everyone listening to this podcast episode right now is choosing to that this show is nutrition, right? This show is adding to their life. It's adding them some nutrients. It's hopefully giving some information and some inspiration that is uplifting and that can be digested in an excellent way to uplift their life in a way that having to filter out toxic 
depressing stuff all the time, it's like that can be adding like some a mental sort of drag. And so really choosing to keep good company, to be around people who help us aspire to really like affirm what we know to be true and don't allow us to stay stuck in limiting beliefs like we are only as good as what we produce every day or that you're not worthy unless you're perfect or, you know, just like all these things that we might be buying into. It can be really helpful to have somebody in your life, either a group of people or a coach or a friend or a group of people that remind you of what you really believe and what's more true than the stuff that is coming at us all the time because it takes effort to filter that. And so it's, you know, just like it's easy to choose healthy foods at the farmer's market. It's way harder at McDonald's, you know, so it's just like choosing the environment that you're part of helps to keep your thoughts nutritious. I love that. Are there any like environmental tips that you recommend or like cornerstone habits that you think are, I mean, as you're talking, I'm realizing that a lot of this requires self-awareness because everyone, every person is going to get a different boost or a strong foundation. Like you talked about sleep. Like I am a 90 year old grandmother inside. Like I cannot skip on sleep. It like, but other people can, you know, like sleep doesn't necessarily like exercise is their main thing. So I know this is very individual to each person, but do you have any kind of greatest hits of foundational habits that you've seen work really well for people? Well, I think that like we're all human beings. And so certain things are just going to be really important. But depending on in Chinese medicine, we think about the fact that each of us has a different constitution. And so we can think about whether we particularly have more yin energy or more yang energy, whether we are wood, fire, earth, metal, or water types in general. Like there might be habits that are more important to different types because they balance a certain kind of energy internally. So I often view the world in that regard. But for example, I'm a wood type, right? My energy grows like a tree where I'm constantly learning and growing and teaching and leading. And like, if I'm not growing, I'm stagnating. Like I I have a lot of upward, outward energy. And so for me, movement is helpful because it helps that upward, outward energy to relax and to feel easeful. But I also definitely need that yin, downward, inward kind of energy where I really need my meditation practice in order to feel connected to myself, right? So the idea of recognizing that my own energy needs to be counterbalanced. So somebody who's like a super social fire type, who's an extrovert, who really needs other people, that person, especially as women, one of the ways that we deal with stress is we tend and befriend, right? So you, you talked about like, yes, we're often the emotional laborers or <laughs> taking on that emotional processing role. But we also, it's part of how we reduce stress biologically as we band together, we make sure everybody's doing okay and we connect with one another. So for a fire type, they might need to have social time, you know, and to feel connected in order for them to feel like themselves. And of course, fire is a very young element. That person also needs the quiet and downtime, but they're going to resist it even more than a wood type will. You know, so for that person, like they're going to need things like sleep and meditation. Earth types tend to want to make sure they're the nurturers. They want to make sure that everybody else is okay. They want to take care of everybody else. And earth element is digestion, right? So those are the people who tend to, when they're not tending to themselves, they might overeat or crave sugar in ways because they are not necessarily meeting their own needs. And so for that person, healthy eating might be an important thing or aligning with natural cycles. Anyway, I could, I could go no, on. No, keep on, going. But yeah, but yeah. I, I go through metal and water. I just <laughs> okay. Well, and, and this is not like, this is by no it's means like, true for like, this is just kind right, of like what I've found, in, you know, with, in working with people. Well, there's um, always different archetypes with people, you know? Yeah. We're all unique butterflies, but then mm-hmm. we also are all very alike as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And so water so, and metal. So, so metal, metal is in Chinese medicine correlates with the lungs and large intestine, but personality wise, metal types can be very structured and very rigid. Like metal can tend to be too hard. And so actually for metal people, having enough space in life that's not structured, the space for spontaneity can be really important for metal types. And again, that social connection with other people that's in the fire element, fire melts metal. So you know, that can be kind of a softening effect. And it's also metal people can also be very artistic and they might need time to be creative. They also, the element that nurtures metal is earth. And so again, like just that making sure that they are nourishing themselves. And water people, like they need a lot of time alone. Water types, kidney and bladder are the the organ systems that relate there. Water types tend to be 
introverted. They tend towards a spiritual path. They need their solitude and time in nature usually is is what water types need the most and time to reflect like water that the moon will reflect on the calm pond not the choppy lake and so they need stillness in order to feel like themselves but they also again they like to balance that tendency towards being inward they also do need to like get out in the world and do stuff so it depends like whether that's exercise or whether that's being social but i kind of think that everybody needs the good nourishment, enough sleep. They need an easeful nervous system. So like whatever allows them to feel relaxed, whether that is like for some people we have access to that through movement. And for some people we have access through that towards something like petting a cat or like, you know, tapping into love so that we can feel like everything's okay. For some people it's nature medicine and we need each other, right? We need to feel connected and loved and like we belong. Juliet's a cat woman. I was thinking when you were talking about the cat, Juliet. <laughs> you can, rather than do your emails, pet your cat while you're taking a nap. <laughs> totally. They're really good as nap partners. They're the best because all they do is nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, in one of my course members, that was her mantra for our easeful living module. Like easeful living is one of the habits that we work on in my level up course. And so, yeah, what would Kayla do became her mantra, Kayla being the cat, like a, a very <laughs> elderly cat, by the way, who sleeps all the time. And so just that, and that was how she was trying to honor her yen, right? Let it be okay that she, this course member had just quit her high powered job and she was getting comfortable with doing less and being quiet and going through a bit of an identity crisis of like, who am I now? And getting comfortable with, oh yeah, like, so just that there's these other colors that we get to paint with in our palette, even if we're used to just picking up one over and over again, we have all these elements within us and it is our birthright to know how to use them all. And so that kind of inner alchemy that we think about in Chinese medicine as a metaphor for how to evolve our consciousness is to get comfortable with all of these different aspects of who we are, even if it's not our predominant element. Allie, do you have an idea of what your element is? Yeah. So it's interesting because do you know who Molly Morrissey is? We had her on the podcast. I don't know if you've heard of her, Brody, no, but she does astrology according to the four temperaments. So I know okay. it's different than the Chinese medicine element, but I have a lot of earth and water in my chart, like mm -hmm. a lot of earth and water. But I think when I was hearing Brody speak, I think I actually have a mix of wood and water. I think that is probably what I would say. Or an, an earth. I don't know. I, I was like going to say, I would have pinned you for earth, but. <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I mean, I <laughs> yeah, I would say, what about you, Juliet? I would pin you for like fire. I think more wood actually. Huh. That's true. I can see. I think I've, I've, I've I can see wood away. I think I've morphed away from fire as I'm getting older. Okay, because I was saying maybe you're wood. Brody, is that something that happens? Maybe you're well, wood on fire. Like you're a forest. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a burning yeah. piece of wood. You have so much energy. Like the amount of physicality that you have, I'm just like in awe of. But I think what Brody was saying is the reason I need that physicality is because like it helps me, you know. What were you saying about wood, Brody, about being physical? It's a way to sort of manage... Yeah, like, like it, the you, if you've got these, uh, if you've got the upward outward energy, yeah. that giving that energy somewhere to go. So giving, you know, giving yourself some cardio, giving yourself an intense workout, you can feel like ah, oh, there's yeah. some, there's some relaxation that happens after that. Exactly, it's not quite so pent up. And then again, like with Chinese medicine, there's the constitutional type that we come in with, and that's a combination of our physiology as well as our psychology. But it's also true. So there's body type stuff and there's like face reading and hand reading and all this other stuff where we could really delve into the what constitutional type we innately are. But there's also the idea of what it took to survive our upbringing. Like the, in order to, if you were raised with parents who really valued achievement, for example, you might have been rewarded for your wood element. Whereas if you had been raised by philosophers, your water element might have gotten stronger. If you were raised by artists, your metal element might have gotten stronger or you know, just depending on whatever it took 
to survive your upbringing, you might have donated more of your chi and blood to that particular element, which is in, in a way a survival strategy. And so being able to, as we go through phases of our life, oh yeah, maybe I've outgrown the need to make everybody else happy. Now maybe I'm interested in, you know, blah, 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 like diverting my energy towards this new thing, which I'm not necessarily in the habit of yet, but it's part of what's possible for us. And again, that speaks to identity death. We have to be willing to let go of doing things the way we've already done them so that we can take risks in, in showing up really differently. And yeah, it was people... just thinking how many how many people are wounded and have a lot of healing to do. And when you can become aware enough to know where that healing needs to start, then you can move towards maybe embodying these other elements and embodying different habits. But a lot of it starts with sort of taking a deeper in, look into yourself to see like, well, where are these drivers coming from? Yeah. And Brody, so I want to ask a question as you were saying identity yeah. death. So I'm turning 40 in like about a month here. And one of the things I really want to like let go is bracing for the worst. I mean, I think it's from having cancer and being bullied. And my parents were huge worriers. I mean, my dad grew up in a very violent area. My mom grew up very poor and had a lot of loss in her life. And so I think I inherited some of that from them and then my own life. What element like do I need to work on? if I want to? I don't want to like brace for the worst anymore. Well, I don't know that I would go elemental on that so much as get a just, therapist. No, I'm just kidding. no, no. I mean, it's like what what you're talking about is that you have a thought pattern that's carved a deep groove, right? Like this is something that it's a habitual thought pattern, and so you're aware of that, and you're wanting your energy to run in a different groove. So this is part of that neuroplasticity idea of how do we get our thoughts to run in a habitually new way? Well, first of all, we have to be aware of what might trigger them to run the old way. Then we have to be really intentional about how we can get them to like, what is your new belief that you're wanting to substitute? So maybe it's something like, what would be the opposite of, I always need to brace for the worst? It would be like, well, see, that's the weird thing is because I take a lot of chances in life, but I think mm -hmm. I'm losing a lot of chi yep. in the process. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you might be. So what would, you, what would you like to believe instead? Well, I think part of bracing for the worst is always being in action and productivity and letting things come to me. Got it. So a deeper truth might be that my life is a balance of effort and ease. Mm, oh my God, I could cry. Is that possible? <laughs> well, it's it's kind of, that's the definition of health in Chinese medicine, right? Is yin and yang being in balance. And so, yeah, if your life is a balance of effort and ease, that, and that's also stira sukha asana, that's the first yoga sutra, right? And, or yoga sutra 2.1 or something like that. I forget what, what it Do is. They get soft. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. In any case, the the idea that, yes, like if you want to believe that life or in, from the Tao Te Ching, do your work, then step back, the only path to serenity. I forget oh. which stanza that is. But if that's what you would like to believe instead, then what you could do is compile evidence in your life that that is true because the brain doesn't know the difference between reality and imagination. And if you're basically, if your belief is your standard operating system. And so like when you go looking at the world, if you believe, for example, that life is risky and the worst is around every turn, your brain is going to show you the Google results of that search, which is, oh yeah, tragedy here, potential catastrophe here. But if you change your thinking so that you're searching for my life is a balance of effort and ease and you're compiling at the end of the day, here's what I did that was effortful. Here's what was easeful. Here's what came to me with that. You know, I found 25 cents in my couch, you know, like that was easeful. Like money just came to me, you know, or like, or a seed that you planted years ago, a relationship that, you know, a project that you started might be bearing fruit just now. And you like, therefore could be reframing your whole life from the sense of, oh yeah, like it's just natural and inevitable that the work, because again, like where you are in the creation cycle, everything that like wood is the growth part. And then we go to manifestation, which is fire, the doing. And then what comes after that is the earth phase, which is reaping what you've sown. And that idea of being nourished by your life, being able to receive the fruits of your labor, being able to reflect on the mountain that you've climbed and look at the view and go, wow, all my effort took me here and I get to be here now. And this is my life that I've created. These are the people that I get to hang out with. This is the business that I get to run. And these are the clients I get to serve. And isn't it amazing? 
you know, like then you can start compiling evidence that life is in fact a balance of effort and ease. And so then you're not just bullshitting yourself with your new belief. You're seeing the evidence of it and your brain is like, oh yeah, obviously that's true. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. Gathering the evidence. I'm very yeah. data driven. So. Yeah. And so I guess it does sort of like fit back to, so that all the, the elements, like we are these elements, but we also move through them just like the seasons. And so recognizing that where we are in the cycle of the cycle of life, really the creation cycle, that you're being able to be on that yin side of it, on that receiving side of it, seeing how you are there as well at just as you are also creating. I love it. I love it. This has been so great. Juliet, do you have any final questions before we let Brody go so that we can have some rest (laughs) for her? (laughs) Yeah, no, this has been so insightful. I love Chinese medicine. Me too. I want to say. Brilliant. It's always vibed with it. And, you know, being someone who goes to acupuncture on the regular, you know, lately, but just over the years, that's always been the thing that I have returned to is Chinese medicine. Just for those who are listening, I encourage you all to definitely dabble and check it out if it's something that you haven't yet experienced. I think it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And taking it off, if you're afraid of needles, you can work with Brody. (laughs) You can. (laughs) I am all about teaching people how to live the philosophy. Chinese medicine is applied philosophy. So it doesn't have to just be acupuncture or herbs. It's about living the balance of yin and yang. It's about integrating the five elements in this inner alchemy. And that's something that I absolutely love helping people look through the lens of Chinese medicine to see themselves in a new way and to be able to (laughs) apply the energetic of life to your own life so that you can be your own healer. I love that. Where can people find you, Brody? They can find me at brodywelch.com. It's Brody with an I-E and Welch with a C-H. And they can check me out on my podcast, A Healthy Curiosity, available where all the finest podcasts are served. (laughs) Thank you so much. (laughs) This insatiable episode is sponsored by my life-changing program, Why Am I Eating This Now? And that's not an exaggeration. Session after session, clients tell me this program changed their life. Or in the case of Shelly, who said, I wish I could bottle this feeling up and give it to everyone. If you're tired of the on-off cycle, want food to stop being worth it in the moment, but not afterwards, and you want to stop self-sabotaging with food, this program is for you. You will learn a clear and exact process with tools for getting to know the root cause of why your emotions overpower you and you eat. You'll also learn with and from a dynamite community that likes to connect over the type of conversations we have on Insatiable. We simplify food, not give you more rules to rebel against. As one Why Am I Eating This Now client says, there's no white knuckling with this process. Early bird registration begins on September 10th. Early birds will receive a discount, early access to the classroom, and a freebie you won't want to miss. So be sure to visit alishapiro.com forward slash Food Freedom 2018 to be notified when registration opens for this year's live session. Thank you, Health Rebels, for tuning in today. Have a reaction, question, or want the transcript from today's episode? Find me at alishapiro.com. I'd love if you leave a review on Apple Podcast and tell your friends and family about Insatiable. It helps us grow our community and share a new way of approaching health in our bodies. Thanks for engaging in a different kind of conversation. And remember, always, your body truths are unique, profound, real, and liberating. Thank you.